Um, so as I was, I mean, as the topic says, today uh, what we're going to talk about is Azure Virtual Machines. Um, so it, it, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, we discussed a few things about this in our last session when we were looking at uh, the recovery of uh, Azure Site Recovery Manager. Uh, today we are going to mostly concentrate only on what Azure has to offer in terms of the IS capabilities, right? So that's the topic. Uh, just a quick introduction again. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter here. I blog on enterprisedaddy.com and my day job is with Rubrik as a senior technical support engineer. So what we're going to look at today at a high level. Firstly, we will try and define what cloud computing is. We'll then uh, dive a little deep into Azure Resource Manager. This was something that was introduced at a later time, and this is how we are going to be deploying our virtual machines. Uh, we'll then try and look at what components make up an Azure virtual machine. And moving forward, we'll look at availability sets. These are basically for um, high availability of your virtual machines. Then we'll look at scale sets. Scale sets are for uh, auto scaling purposes. Suppose you have an application that uh, needs to be deployed and you want auto scaling enabled for it, uh, you will be using scale sets. Uh, the equivalent of this in AWS would be um, auto scaling, right? And finally, we'll look at Azure VM Agent. This agent comes default, uh, installed default on most of the virtual machines that you deploy from the marketplace and it might require extra steps if you have uploaded your images or uh, if you created your virtual machines from scratch. Um, so let's quickly move into defining what cloud computing is. So NIST is a national institute, uh, you know, where which basically defines a lot of things with respect to technology. So the a high level definition that they have given it says it's, it's cloud computing is a model for enabling ubiquitous, by ubiquitous you mean present, convenient on-demand network access to a shared pool of configurable computing resources, right? So now these computing resources uh, can be network switches, servers, storage, application, and other related services. All of this which that can be rapidly provisioned and released with minimal management effort or service provider interaction. So if you look at the definition itself, it's, it's actually a true definition of what cloud computing is. For example, today, if you were to go ahead and go to any uh, public or private cloud provider, and you know you can go ahead and create multiple resources without even involving anybody, right? All of that stuff is configured in the backend. Uh, everything is automated. You as a user just have to make a few clicks and you have the desired results, right? So that's what cloud computing is. And if you uh, want more information about this, I've already I've given a link and I'll be sharing the slides at the, in the end of the session. So you can go and read more about this, right? So before we move forward, and uh, as I was telling, we're gonna be looking at virtual machines, which, for, which falls under the infrastructure as a service category of the cloud computing model. Uh, let's try and define what other stuff we have here so that you know we have a fair enough understanding of uh, how cloud computing uh, service models are or what they are. So quickly here, uh, if you look at the slide, we have four columns. The first one is a traditional data center, right? So if you look at various components that go into building a data center, all of that was managed by us as admins, right? Maybe uh, you might be managing some bit of it, but end of the day, it was all taken care of by the administrator himself, right? So if you look at the stack, you firstly start off with networking. So you know, this includes your routers, switches, firewalls. All of this was taken care of by uh, a traditional network uh, network admin. Then comes the storage, where you know a storage admin would take care of uh, the storage devices, go ahead, create LUNs and all that kind of stuff. Then comes the servers. This is your physical hardware servers and then the virtualization platform where you would either use uh, some hypervisor of your choice. And above that then comes the operating system, then you have middleware, then you have certain runtime libraries, uh, then you have the data layer and the application layer itself, right? So all of this stuff in a traditional data center was taken care of by the uh, company itself. Now, when you slowly move into the second column, and if you look at infrastructure as a service, the first uh, bottom four 
are actually taken care by the service provider. In this case, we are talking about Azure, but this, imply, this applies to any of your vendors. And uh, up until the hypervisor, you know, it's, it's the vendor's responsibility to make sure that uh, all the patches are taken care, the software is up to date, and all that kind of stuff, right? So, and anything above the operating system layer is taken care by the end user. Um, and if you move towards the third column, which is a platform as a service, uh, only the data and the application is taken care of by the end user. Everything else is taken care of by the uh, service provider. So a classic example for this in the Azure world uh, will be the app service, right? Azure app service, where you go ahead and uh, maybe want to deploy a web application. All you really need to care about is how the data resides there and how the application performs or what you want to do with an application, right? Uh, final but not the least, uh, which is software as a service. Uh, sure, you just consume the service in its in its native form that the service provider provides. Now, we guys are so used to using Gmail. You know, it, it's a it's a style, classic example of software as a service. Uh, you then have Office 365. Uh, another very important example is Salesforce, which uh, you know it just gives you uh, the software in its form and its true form, and you go ahead and use it. They also give you certain APIs at the end of the day, uh, which you can actually make use of, uh, you know, customizing the application itself. But the raw application can be used uh, as it is, right? So, any questions on on the computing uh, service models? Okay, great. So I'll take that as a no. And uh, Shanavas, do you have a question? No. Not awesome. So I'll, I'll move forward. Uh, so we'll, yeah, we'll, quickly, we'll quickly deep dive into uh, you know Azure infrastructure as a service. Now, if you broadly look at this, uh, obviously we'll be talking about virtual machines. But before you could even move along, we were talking, uh, looking at the previous slide, we were talking about networking built in as well. So uh, in Azure IaaS, it's mostly going to be about Azure virtual machines and Azure virtual network. And uh, as I was telling earlier, networking, compute, storage, and hypervisor are all managed by Microsoft. And starting from the operating system, everything is taken care of by you. Uh, this also, I, I would just briefly want to touch upon, you know, the shared responsibility model. Uh, it's it, it was something that was put up by AWS, but you know that kind of applies to any of the uh, public cloud, public services or cloud services that you are trying to use, right? So there are certain things that the vendor itself will take care of, and there are certain things that you are responsible for. So even before you try and deploy anything to the cloud, I would highly recommend you go out and read the shared responsibility model, which clearly explains who takes care of what under the IIS platform, right? So uh, let's quickly jump into the resource manager. Now this was introduced a few years ago uh, when you know Azure started somewhere in the year 2009. And they you, they had something called a classic deployment. The problem with that was, you know, uh, there was not a lot of granularity uh, in terms of uh, the role-based access control, and it, it had certain drawbacks. So, what Microsoft uh, did was introduced Resource Manager a few years ago, which uh, took care of a lot of shortcomings what classic deployment had. Um, so, it's basically a service that is used to provision resources in your Azure subscription. Right. So when you go ahead and create a account with Azure, you firstly have to select a subscription type, right? So um, I have certain blog posts on the website which explains uh, what are the different subscriptions and uh, how you can avail some of them for free, right? So you firstly need a subscription, and uh, Resource Manager is a service that deploys or provisions resources in that subscription, right? Uh, it enables you to work with the resources in your solution as a group. So we will, uh, in the next slides, we'll be looking at what a resource group is. With the help of resource manager, you can go ahead and create resource groups that then becomes your logical boundary in terms of how you want to manage resources within that resource group. Uh, it also provides you with security, auditing, and tagging features uh, in order to better manage the resources that uh, are deployed and uh, the most important thing is it gives you a consistent management layer 
uh, to perform any task uh, against the service fabric itself, right? So various, various uh, tools that you can use in this case are first Azure PowerShell. Uh, anybody who is used to PowerShell, uh, you just need to import the module and uh, start you know, coding or creating resources against the service fabric. Uh, again, with uh, PowerShell 6.0, Microsoft made it uh, a core version, which is cross-platform. You can run that on Windows, Linux, or Mac, and you have the same consistent uh, experience across all these platforms. Similarly, we have Azure CLI. So people uh, coming from, let's say, VMware background, you guys might have used ESX CLI. And uh, you know, as soon as you don't know a certain command, all you do is ESX CLI and hit enter. It gives you the further namespaces what, or what you can, how you can interact with your hypervisor. So C uh, Azure CLI is something in the similar lines. Uh, once you install it on your machine, you just hit AZ login. Uh, and that basically logs you into the uh, your subscription and you can then go ahead and create or manipulate any resources that you have within a subscription uh, Azure portal. This is the most common way that people interact uh, with Azure and then you have rest APIs. Uh, let's assume that there are certain things that you cannot do with PowerShell and CLI or for that matter, even on the portal. Microsoft provides you low level REST APIs that you can actually go ahead and try and read and understand and make some changes that you're interested in. And also they give you client SDKs. Uh, this are usually used by the third party vendors who want to uh, interact uh, with the Azure service fabric itself and want to build services around what Azure has to offer, right? So the, uh, the resource manager gives you that consistent management layer and that's how uh, this the, or these are the ways that you can actually go ahead and interact with it. Um, so we'll try and define some of the things uh, before we move forward. Firstly, uh, a resource, right? So let's try and break down a virtual machine. Uh, a virtual machine will have multiple resources. Uh, it's something that you will not be able to see while you're trying to create a virtual machine, but uh, once we look into the demos, you will see what a resource is. It's basically a logical uh, uh, unit that um, it's just a very basic level unit uh, that is used to form uh, bigger services, right? Uh, then you have a resource group. As we're telling you, this is a logical boundary. Uh, you can go anywhere you want with the resource groups. Now you might see sometimes that you want to create one resource group for a virtual machine, right? And it will have uh, resources like your disk, uh, network adapter, IP address, um, all that kind of stuff, right? So it completely depends from on, on a queue as to how you want to manage your resource groups. Now you might try and create a resource group, put all the network security groups into that, or you might have a certain application doing the same job, uh, which is deployed as a web app or a virtual machine, and you want to put all of that in a resource group. So uh, from a management standpoint, it becomes a lot easier. You then have resource providers. Uh, these are responsible for provisioning the resources themselves. Now, for example, whenever you try and create a storage account in, in Azure, uh, it's the uh, Azure.Storage resource provider that is responsible for creating that resource, right? So uh, there are quite a few of the resource providers. Uh, we can try and take a look uh, if time permits how many of them are there and what they do, right? Uh, you then have a resource manager template. So uh, this is another way that you can actually deploy uh, resources within Azure. You have a template uh, which you just say deploy and it basically takes certain parameters. It's in the JSON format. Uh, it takes certain parameters and then goes ahead and deploys those resources for you. Uh, all of this follows a uh, declarative syntax. If you look at JSON, it basically is a key value pair where you have a certain key and that has a certain value, right? So for example, uh, let's say you wanted to create a virtual machine, you will just go ahead and say, you know, a VM size is this and this, you know, so VM size becomes your key and the size becomes your value, right? So the entire template follows a declarative syntax where you just define something and the service fabric will make it happen. Uh, next, we'll try and look at what com what are the components that make up a virtual machine. Uh, firstly, the virtual machine itself, right? So this is a logical construct around this 
you will have multiple things that plug into it, like your disk, your network adapters, and your IP addresses and all that stuff. So uh, we, we were talking about the resource providers, right? So the compute resource provider is responsible for creating that logical virtual machine construct. What you really get into this uh, is the CPU and the memory from the hypervisor itself, right? Uh, you then have the VHD files. There are two types of files. Uh, one is an image, the other one is a disk. Now, disks are, are something you know where you have your operating system that resides on it, and image is something where you can create a virtual machine out of it, right? So I've, I recently written an article where I explained uh, you know where uh, what you do is once you have the ISO image of uh, any any virtual machine or, or any operating system, how do you upload that as an image, and how do you then create a virtual machine out of that image? So you can actually go ahead and read that which will give you an explanation of what an image or the differences between an image and a disk, right? Then comes the virtual network. Within the virtual network, these are the things that uh, may or may not be required. Submit is something that you'll have to definitely define. Uh, this, this, dif this decides uh, how many uh, objects that you can, dis or how many devices that can be deployed in a submit. Uh, an IP address is obviously required for communication between virtual machines. Sometimes you might have to use a load balancer. For example, I said earlier that we'll be talking about scale sets, and that would require a load balancer. So uh, we'll try and look into that. And you then need uh, network security groups. So these uh, basically define the communication between different virtual machines. So you might have, uh, let's say, or let's say you go ahead and create a virtual machine in Azure, and if you want an RDP connection to that virtual machine, you have to make sure that the port 3389 is open, right? So these basically define the incoming and outgoing uh, firewall rules kind of a thing here. Uh, I'll show you how these works and uh, how we can modify this uh, in the demo session, right? So uh, we've been talking about virtual machine for some time now, and we also spoke uh, what the resource providers are. Now let's try and understand, you know, at the bare minimum, what resource providers are required for a single uh, virtual machine in Azure. So if you look at this, uh, let's start from the left. Um, so if you look at SRP, what that means is a storage resource provider. Now that is responsible for, for creating the storage account and within storage account, uh, we store disks in the blob storage, right? So that's what the storage resource provider is going to do. And the second column, we look at the compute resource provider, which creates a logical virtual machine. That's nothing but providing you the CPU and the memory. And uh, we'll also be looking at availability sets. As I was telling earlier, this is for high availability of your application. Uh, we'll try and look at you know certain certain definitions around it and how do you go ahead and create it. The most interesting thing is is your network resource provider because you know it has a lot of things there. Firstly, it will create a virtual network for you, uh, then submit within that. Uh, network, uh, network security groups, as I, as I was telling you, that lets you define inbound and outbound uh, port rules, basically allowing you certain communication between the virtual machines. Uh, it then also allows you to create uh, NIC itself, virtual NIC. Uh, it also provisions IP addresses that could be internal private or public or private IP addresses. Uh, you also then have a load balancer that we spoke about. There are two different types of load balancers. Uh, one is internal, the other one is external. External you usually will use when you have a application that is public facing and internal uh, when you, know, you don't want your virtual machines behind the load balancers to be able to talk to the outside world. Um, before we move into any of the demos, uh, I want you to I want you guys to understand uh, virtual machine series as to you know what offerings are available from Microsoft. Uh, we'll start off with A series. Uh, these are entry level economical VMs. So if you're just um, new or if your organization is just trying to test the waters in Azure, this is something that you can start off with. They're usually used for dev and test. Not not very beefed up virtual machines, but uh, you can try and uh, try and test certain applications uh, because these are mostly for dev test, not recommended for production workloads. Uh, these are again B series. These are very very small VMs. 
um, if I were to convert this uh, or the cost of this in Indian rupees, uh, you hardly have to pay like, you know, one rupee per hour, that kind of a thing. So, you know, extremely cheap. Uh, again, you very small VMs, you know, you get somewhere from one CPUs to maybe a couple of gigs, not more than that. Now, these are the, the D series is something that's actually the one that you will see most of the guys using in production workloads. This is general purpose compute. Uh, starts off with a few vCPUs and goes up till about, uh, I think, you know, 64 gigs of RAM or something of that sort. E-series, so if you have certain applications that, that um, require hybrid threading, um, in, in memory requirements, you know, go with E-series. Uh, there is a dedicated uh, web, web page available for this, wherein Microsoft goes and explains, uh, you know, if you have a certain application requirement, what is the best virtual machine series that you can use? And uh, because those are then optimized for certain application types, right? Um, compute optimized, so if your F series compute optimized, you have a certain application or a virtual machine where your requirement is a very high CPU. Uh, you know, compute series is something, F series is something that you would want to look at. Uh, G series memory and storage optimized. Uh, again, if your requirements are high, high memory and fast storage, uh, go with G series. H series, you know, high performance virtual machines. Then you have L series, storage optimized virtual machines. I think what you can do with L series, if I remember correctly, is you know you can have the largest. Uh, and these are all local storage atta attached to the hypervisor. I think the single disk that you can attach to an operating system is, is about six terabytes of local SSD, right? So it really depends on what your application is and what you're trying to do with, or try and create, or what you're trying to do with the virtual machine that you're trying to create there. You then have M series. These are again, very, very high uh, memory requirements for a virtual machine. I think with M series, you can go up to four terabyte of RAM on a single virtual machine, right? So very big virtual machines. You then have N series, so let's assume that you are deploying desktops in the cloud and GPU is one of the requirements. N series is something that you'll probably be looking at. Right, so uh, we have described all of this. Uh, the next thing that we'll try and understand is how, how does it come or how does it translate to cost-wise, right? So although Whenever you log into Azure, everything talks that uh, the cost of this virtual machine is going to be per hour, but you are actually built on a per minute basis. Now, this was something that changed recently. Earlier, what used to happen was if your virtual machine was, let's say, powered on for one minute and one hour, you were still, I'm sorry, one hour and one minute, you were still built for two hours, right? So this was something that a lot of people were complaining about. And what Microsoft de then did was, they're going to uh, they started billing you on a per minute basis so this is this is a welcome change and i think a lot of people have actually liked this obviously there is a direct relationship between the virtual machine status and how how that is going to cost you so if a virtual machine is in a running state obviously uh, you know you're paying whatever you have agreed upon uh, mostly people are using pay as you go model uh, which you are then built on a per minute basis. But recently uh, I was talking about reserve instances where you actually go ahead and uh, buy or pay Microsoft upfront and uh, you get discounts on different virtual machine types. Then you have stopped. The VM is stopped, but uh, it's obviously deployed onto a physical host. It's still billable. It's not running, but you're still using the underlying resources that Microsoft has to provide. Uh, obviously, it's stopped and deallocated. Uh, you're not built for this because the virtual machine is then deleted uh, from the underlying hypervisor itself, right? Um, any questions before we move on to the demo? Yes, uh, Adil. Mm -hmm. So I saw that uh, you said the resource provider and resource group. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm correlating with the V Cloud directors. So for resource provider, it's underlying compute, the storage and network, right? And you explained well. I got it. 
in the next slide so mm-hmm. what uh, resource group it's similar to because w- during subscription we have to create for resource group to mm-hmm. then we can create the virtual machine in it right correct so yes. it's a combination of uh, cpu memory right not necessarily cpu memory so any resource provider uh, can can put its resource in in a single resource group right so i'll i'll show you how that translates you know uh, there will be little subtle differences between what you're talking about v cloud uh, honestly i've never had experience working with it but no problem uh, so in in a general uh, vmware term resource means cpu and memory only we separating storage and uh, network so mm-hmm. when we pronounce taking the resource means we talking about the cpu and memory no we we are not Please talking we are not restricting our conversation here to cpu and memory it applies to anything right so we we saw different three three different resource providers in 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 the previous slides where one was compute the other one was storage and you then have uh, you know network you also have something called uh, web resource providers if i remember correctly uh, where we spoke about platform as a service and i told you that you can use azure app service to deploy different sort of websites and web applications right so it's the web resource provider that will go provision those websites and all of that for you so uh, if time permits i'll actually try and show you what different types of resource providers are available uh, otherwise you know we'll take it offline uh, and try and see uh, how, no how problem just one this. thing mm-hmm. uh, during the uh, types of vm we mm-hmm. miss the c category of vm oh okay all right maybe there is something i try i would have forgotten to add it you mention a b and d not c oh so th- okay that way then th- there is not necessarily a c type available these are just uh, you know definition so i'll actually t- show you a page no no problem i just clear my doubt so c is okay. there something or c is so i i don't there. think i don't think there is c i don't think there is c but uh, let's just quickly go to their uh, web page and try and identify that right so i off the top of my head i don't think there is so a series b series and d series no we don't have c series here right so uh, if you want more information uh, around this uh, always come here uh, this i'll maybe try and put this into the slides uh, which gives you more explanation on you know what type of uh, applications are best suited for which series of virtual machines right so that's that and uh, let's quickly jump on so if we go back to the slides uh, we'll try and first create a virtual machine using the portal i'll show you guys how this looks like uh, you know let's say you first go click on create a resource uh, let's try and select maybe a windows virtual machine 2006 running data center edition you'll quickly have to provide a name to the virtual machine uh we looked at this earlier is it going to be ssd or hard disk provide a username and a password that she'll then use to log in subscription type create new i want to go ahead and create a new resource group so right if you look at the resource group and definition here it basically says that it's a collection of resources that share the same life cycle permissions and policies right a very high level definition um so that's what a resource group is which location you want i'll just select south india and say okay that then takes me to the next blade here is where i would get to select the virtual machine sizes that we just spoke about right and uh, right i can select this guys here so if my requirement is general purpose compute i'll just say general purpose compute and it will automatically uh, show me only those right so in this case i'll just say ds1 v2 let's just say next um we look at availability sets or actually let me complete availability sets first uh, this will uh, allow us to you know move further uh, and we might not have to uh, waste some time around that so yeah quickly let's quickly talk about availability sets uh, they ensure that the they already says ensure that azure virtual machines are deployed across multiple isolated hardware nodes in a cluster right 
so uh, only a subset of virtual machines are impacted in case of a hardware or a software failure and they are deployed across multiple fall domains and update domains so in the next slide we'll try and define what fall domains and update domains are so if you were to meet the 99.95 uh, percent sla that microsoft offers then you will have to deploy your virtual machines in an availability set except in the case of premium storage which is managed disk where a single virtual machine has an availability of 99.9 uh, of five nines or something of that sort right so let's try and define what a fall domain and an update domain is a fall domains define the group of virtual machine that share a common power source and network switch what i mean by this so if you look at that uh, diagram uh fd0 and anything below that that's fall domain zero and it's it's basically a single rack which uh, shares you know uh, over the rack switch uh so the only common failure for this could be if that network switch goes down anything that's residing on this rack will not be able to then communicate to the other infrastructure in that data center so the common failure point for this is that network switch or the underlying power resource itself or if the power goes down and everything on that rack fails you know that then becomes that rack actually becomes your fault domain zero and similarly you have fault domain one and two uh, at this time the maximum that you can go is three fault domains and up to 20 update domains now let's try and define what update domain means update domain indicates group of virtual machines and underlying physical hardware that can be rebooted at the same time now we discussed about the share responsibility model right where you are responsible for taking care of some of the things about the virtual machine and microsoft is responsible for taking care of the underlying infrastructure itself now obviously you know microsoft would want to go ahead and update the hypervisor or try and perform uh, certain changes on the networking stack and all of that right so uh, you can define your virtual machines to be placed under update domains which will then allow microsoft saying that uh, you know this can be rebooted or these two or three virtual machines can be rebooted at the same time now let's take a hypothetical example where i have a, a application where i go ahead and define three fall domains and six update domains right so the first virtual machine that is deployed will go to fall domain zero and update domain zero right moving forward uh, the fourth virtual machine will again come back to fall domain zero right so uh, if there were an issue uh, on the microsoft infrastructure fall domain zero goes down that means your virtual machine one and three can be down however the other four virtual machines will still be up and running and will be doing what they're supposed to do uh, I said that we'll have five update domains, right? So in, the, in this example, if we go six VMs, the sixth virtual machine will come back to update domain zero. Uh, and what I'm saying Microsoft when I do that is saying that these two VMs can be rebooted if you have to perform any sort of any sort of underlying physical uh, hardware changes, right? So that's what availability sets is. We'll try and quickly look at uh, the the demo as to how you go ahead and create it. Now, if you guys remember uh, in our last session, we spoke about managed disks and unmanaged disks, right? Uh, managed disk is, is a service that Microsoft recently announced where uh, you don't have to worry about the underlying storage. You don't have to worry about uh, how you create storage accounts. What is the replication policy on the storage account? Uh, Microsoft just tells you that I will give you this amount of SLA 99 point a few nines you don't have to worry uh, we will make sure that the disks are always going to be available how does that translate when you're using availability sets uh, there's a quick diagram that shows this again going with the same example fall domain 0 1 and 2 in this case i've taken uh, three vms in an availability set now if you look at the managed disk part that also comprises microsoft makes sure that all the disks associated with that virtual machine zero uh, uh, which are managed is also will sit under the same fault domain right so that gives you 
uh, a good availability of whenever one of the fault domains actually goes down. Uh, if we were to quickly compare this to unmanaged disks, as you can see, the storage cluster construct comprises of all your storage accounts, right? So that then becomes your storage account zero, storage account one, and storage account two. There are certain, obviously, if you ask me, I would recommend going with managed disk because that's what Microsoft says most of the times, uh, unless you know you really know what you're doing with the storage accounts itself, right? So there are some best practices when you're using storage accounts and availability sets. Microsoft says that you put all your uh, disk with respect to that virtual machine on the same storage account and use one storage account per virtual machine. Now that's it's very easy to say that, but there's a problem uh, when it comes to uh, resources, right? So under one subscription, I cannot create more than 800 resource groups and within a resource group i cannot have more than 800 resources right so uh, this then becomes a problem as to how you will def uh, you know go ahead and design your infrastructure so which is why uh, it's always better to go with manage this going forward uh, there's not a lot of cost difference there's less overhead you're basically telling microsoft to take care of everything and provide you that maximum sla without even uh, bothering how the underlying infrastructure is, is taken care. So we'll quickly go back to our demo. Uh, so on the third setting, when you're creating a virtual machine, you have an option whether this virtual machine is going to be in a availability set or not. So if I click on that, I can go ahead and create one. Provide uh, Azure AS. And as I was telling you, fault domains and update domains. I'll just go with, that's fine, I'll just leave it as five. And I just say, okay. And I'm saying that I want to use manage disks, right? So if I say no, I'll then have to, you know, provide a storage account and what the replication policy is going to be on that and all of that stuff. So I don't want to, I don't want that. I want Microsoft for me to take care of that. Uh, by default, it will go ahead and create a virtual network. It will create a subnet. It's going to create a public IP address. Uh, here then comes the network security group. Since it's a Windows virtual machine, I want uh, RDP service to be enabled and that port to be open. We'll look at extensions at a later time. Yeah, so again, auto shutdown feature, you're basically telling Microsoft that if I forget to shut down this virtual machine on a daily basis at 7 p.m. UTC time, go shut it down for me. Uh, monitoring, uh, you can see boot diagnostic. Sometimes what happens is your virtual machines might not come up. This takes point in time screenshot of what is really going on and provides you in the diagnostic logs. Again, there's some logging that you can do at the guest OS, and you can you can save that in a storage account of your choice. Backup is disabled. Let's not do that. So I'm just going to say OK for now. So it, it runs a validation behind the scenes, making sure that uh, you know is everything that you input is correct or not, and it gives you a very high level summary. Uh, what your subscription is. I'm asking it to create a new resource group and I'm creating that in the South India location. See here, once these resources are provisioned behind the scenes, you'll slowly try and uh, they'll populate here. So here, first thing, it, it created a Windows IP. Similarly, it created a availability set. It's in the process of creating certain storage accounts, uh, virtual networks, and all that stuff. So we'll, we'll come back to it shortly. Uh, if you look at the presentation, no.
right so we created a virtual machine using portal this is i wanted wanted what i wanted to show in the live demo the second i told you that i'll be showing this using the powershell um, what we'll do is quickly provision a uh, virtual machine using powershell right now i told you earlier I, I don't remember if i've told you this but there's a concept of cloud shell uh, you know recently microsoft introduced this they dedicated this page as well or web page for Cloud Shell itself, uh, you can, it comes with two, two things. One is Bash, the other one is PowerShell. Uh, I'm just gonna say I want uh, PowerShell. Behind the scenes, it runs PowerShell core version six. Um, it comes default with all the modules imported that are required for Azure. Otherwise, you know, I would have to need a uh, I would need a Windows or a, any, any of, if I'm using PowerShell core, then I can use it on Windows, Linux or Mac. But if, if I had a Windows machine, I would typically want to install PowerShell on top of it first and then install the uh, Azure module on top of it, PowerShell module on top of it, and then import that module and then execute anything against my uh, subscription, right? So this, uh, it, it's available online. Uh, there's no dependency of any sort of uh, machine required. You just go to this place. Uh, it's automatically logged me in because I have a, a active connection in another in, in uh, window. So once it's up, uh, we'll try and try and create a VM. Let's see how that goes. Right. So I have a I have a quick script that's written here. Um, I'll show you how this goes, right? So the first four things what I'm doing here is defining certain variables. I'm saying that this is my subscription name. Uh, this is going to my, be my new resource group. Uh, this is going to be my storage account. In the previous example, while we deployed from the UI or the portal, we created managed disk, right? So in this case, we are going to see how an unmanaged disk is going to look like. So. For that, I'm defining a storage account and a location of my choice. So there you go. Uh, we've already connected to the cloud shell. Uh, everything is up and running. So I'm just gonna say enter. It goes out, uh, starts defining those variables for me. Uh, once that is done, uh, this is not required login because you've already logged in. Uh, I'm just selecting my Azure subscription here. Once it's done, I'm setting the context going forward that anything that we do in this session is going to be against the subscription, right? So I've set that uh, Azure using a command called set Azure RM context, right? And uh, yeah, I think that's not required for now. So this command will go out and create a new resource group. It takes the parameters name and location. So I've already defined what the name is going to be and in which location that I want to create this resource group. So as you can see, it, it's extremely fast, right? So you just go ahead and provide the details. It's gonna go out and create those things for you. So in the next uh, command, what, what we are seeing is I'm trying to create a new storage account, which has takes a parameter called under which resource group what is the name of the storage account uh, what type of replication we, we touched upon this in our last session uh, we have locally redundant geo redundant so in this case i'm just saying locally redundant and uh, obviously which location that i want to create this in right no it, this one's taken So I'm just going to rename that to something else. Let's see if that actually comes up or not. Looks like, uh, you know, this was taken. Test arm storage account 01. So again, this has to be unique, uh, right? So 
Yeah, I think that was taken. Yeah. So this will go out and create that storage account. Once it's done, I will have to run this again. Okay, so we've defined that. So this will just go ahead and get the keys. Here I'm saying that go ahead and create a new subnet, right? So let's just wait for this to complete. Okay, so these three commands, we got the keys. Uh, we are setting the storage context saying that any any commands going forward execute against that storage account and I have now created a new storage container called PhDs within that uh, and uh, within that storage account. The next thing I'm going to do is create a new subnet. Right, so once the subnet is created, uh, I'm going to go ahead and create a new virtual network, right? So if you see, I'm defining my subnet to be 10 slash 24, so I can have a maximum of 252 devices connected to this. There are certain IPs that Microsoft reserves for themselves within a subnet. Uh, I think you roughly, you get about 250 in, in, in a subnet of slash 24. So my bnet is created, my subnet is created. Uh, I'm this. I'm saying next is go ahead and create a public IP for my virtual machine. That I'll be using this for my virtual machine. So straightforward again. Uh, you know the commands are. If you look at the commands, you know they are very very expressive. It says you know new Azure RM public IP address. You know even if you're new to PowerShell, it, it's pretty straightforward in the way that they've defined the commands. Uh, and uh, you have any doubts, just do get help. It will tell you what are the mandatory parameters. In most cases, you would see that you will always, always have to define these two at least. One is your resource group, the other one is location because you have to tell Microsoft where are you deploying these, right? Uh, name, obviously, in this case, you have to provide something and the allocation method that I'm saying that it's going to be dynamic. So once that is done, uh, I will be then using or creating a new network adapter that I'll be using for my virtual machine. So as you can see, you know, it, it's not very easy uh, to go just, you know, as you would provision a virtual machine typically, right? So you have to first make all the components that are required for a virtual machine. Uh, we are doing this upfront and, uh, you know, we then create a virtual machine after that, right? So I'm just going to say, uh, credentials, what it's going to be. I'm saying that this is the username. And this is going to be my password. Quickly, right? Let's try and see within South India region what all VM sizes are available, right? So if you see, these are the sizes available, and some of them even go with the look at this memory, right? These are pretty small VMs. This has about uh, 50 odd gigs. I think a few of them go. Just probably is a terabyte, I guess, if I'm not wrong. So, you know, very, very big VMs. Uh, like this one has 128 vCPUs. This is in the M series that we looked earlier. I don't think N series is still available within this region, but M series is definitely here, right? Look at this guy, you know, the maximum that you can get is roughly about four terabytes and 128 vCPUs, so, you know, huge VMs. So what I'm, uh, out of that, I'm just going to, you know, select my VM size as standard A2, small ones that will do the job for this demo. And, uh, you know, 
select this guy again about the operating system stuff a little bit and i'll share the script at the end of the day um, and see how we can get this going so i'm, I'm just going to deploy a red hat you no know, red hat 7.2 i hope that's available and i'm just going to use the latest version yeah that's available uh, i'm in this with using this command i'm adding adding the network interface to that cons uh, virtual machine construct once that is done the disk that i created earlier i'm just going again you now adding that to that virtual machine construct and here is where i actually create the virtual machine right so this is the command that you need to create the virtual machine but before even we created this we had a lot of background job that we had to do like creating the public ip address uh, you know making sure the storage account was created uh, and disk was created within that storage account uh, even before that a container that was created uh, public ip addresses that were required so a lot of uh stuff required before you can go ahead and create this okay i know where i messed up so i messed up here Right. So if you see if something goes wrong, uh, you know, it gives you very descriptive messages uh, to go ahead and actually resolve it as well. So it, it's telling me that that storage account was not resolved or uh, what we are trying to do doesn't exist. Right. So I'm just going to say other storage account zero one. I think that should do the job. Right. Once that is done, we'll then create the VM. Now let's go back and see how this guy went from the UI. There we go, boom, right? So everything is created and you can see uh, it also, we, we told that the VM has to be shut down uh, if it's not doing something. So it created uh, something for that. And you can see here, my Linux VM, I was, we are creating this actually uh, from the PowerShell session, right? And this is my Windows virtual machine that I created from the UI. I just have to click on this connect guy. It's going to take an RDP session uh, onto this public interface. Now the public IP address. Right, so I'm just going to download the RDP file. This will bring up then a screen that'll allow me to connect. There you go, right? So we are connected to a VM that's deployed in the cloud. We'll, we'll, we'll slowly come back to it in a minute. Um, let's see what's going on. Let's quickly try and look at our resource groups, right? So uh, how this goes. So we created this resource group for the first VM uh, using the UI. And you would see, you know, this resource group has an availability set. It has a, a account, diagnostic account to keep my boot logs it has a virtual network it has a virtual machine it has a disk a network interface a public ip address and network security groups i'll just quickly show you a little bit about network security groups uh, i was telling you these are used for inbound outbound uh, security rules uh, if you see this uh, you know we've just enabled inbound rule 330 uh, 3389 if i were to create something new um i would come here inbound security rules and just click on add uh, i can then define what protocol is an action i want to allow it deny it uh, what priority i want to set give it a descriptive name and all that stuff right same same thing 
I can do on the outbound rule as well. Uh, if you want to look at virtual networks, uh, you can go down here, look at this. This was created for this example. Uh, and if you can see, you no, know, there's one device that's connected and it has this IP address. Similarly, uh, you can even define what address space it is, uh, you know, uh, what are the subnets that you've created. Firewall is something that's in preview. Maybe, you know, we can actually uh, try and work on this or try and have a session on this as well. Uh, DNS servers, we are using Microsoft's uh, Azure provided. If, if you had a connection on-prem, let's assume that you had this region connected to your on-prem data center using a side-to-side -side VPN or something of that sort, uh, you can define your custom DNS servers, which will then, which will then, I mean, the virtual machines will then use to for name resolution and all that stuff, right? We have a uh, peering. Uh, this is something that we'll try and cover maybe when we have a session solely on networking. Uh, I can connect two different virtual networks and uh, you know anything within those virtual networks will then be able to talk to each other. So this is something that's available. This is similar to what uh, I think it's called VPN peering in Azure uh, in those similar lines that we have this. Um, let's see if our Linux is provisioned. Uh, I guess it is. Yeah. So let's go to the virtual machines. Now I'm, I'm looking at this from the. I'm talking about the one. Okay. Failed. Right, so that's one way of doing it. Uh, the third method I wanted to show is, I don't know if it is available. Oh, nice. Uh, so again, AZ, as I was telling you, is, is a cross-platform uh, utility that I can use to uh, manage my Azure resources. So, you know, I just typed AZ, as you can see, once AZ was typed, you know, all of these are available. Uh, or all of these namespaces are available for me to you know work through this so we we'll look at an example that i have look at this right so i'm saying az group create give that as a name this guy and under this location right so this is going to go out and create a resource group called my resource group in the south india location Right, that was done. And it's straightforward when using uh, AZ, just say VM create, this is my resource group, this is going to be my name, uh, what's going to be my image, what is the uh, username, and for password, we're just going to go ahead and generate certain keys. I'm sorry. So it's going to go out and do that. Let's see if this VM powered on in the meantime. It did not. All right. So I think because of messing up that command, you know, uh, it's not created that disk properly. Uh, anyway, so that's how you would do this. Uh, but I, I hope that you got the overall idea as to how this works.
All right. Any any questions up until uh, up until now, guys? So we have any API SDK? Let's say uh, I know the catalog is available. Okay, but mm -hmm. let's see if I want to create an internal uh, catalog for my organization. Hello. I I say. Uh, the self service catalog for my internal organization okay mm -hmm. and uh, i need uh, some api sdk to integrate uh, my cloud portal so i want to hide the azure technicalities i just mm -hmm. want to create a ready to use framework for my uh, developers and the qa okay mm -hmm. so that they will have the list of operating system and the size of vm and mm -hmm. That's it, okay, and the application name, okay. Mm -hmm. I, so think, that, I think it uh, should be they, possible. It should be possible. There are certain. Uh, again, I, I'm I'm not a developer, so uh, you know I don't know much about the SDKs, but uh, you know there should be something available where you can you know uh, create some sort of a UI for your developers, which will then show you know within that region what VM series is available. And uh, they can select one of those to go ahead and uh, deploy it, right? Correct. So, is there any uh, orchestrator? I heard about System Center orchestrator. It mm -hmm. can be used with the Azure, or it is for the only on-premises. I think, uh, off the top of my head, it's only for on-prem. I don't think that probably is going to be integrating with Azure. But we can, I can, you know, look into that and get back to you. But. I do not have a ready-made answer at this time. It could be done, I guess. All right. And we use SCCM for similar to monitor this application and virtual machines performance and all. No, so we don't use SCCM. We you can deploy SCCM on the VMs and you know work that way. But Microsoft provides you certain built-in monitoring for the VMs. Uh, you know that you can use alerts and all the, all of that. So you will just receive emails. It's all built into the system. So uh, to answer that question, I'll just show you quickly here. So if I go to a virtual machine and you know select this guy here that we created earlier, uh, there is a dedicated section for monitoring, right? So I can create alerts, right? I have certain metrics that I can monitor. Like, I mean, there are, there are a lot of them. Look at this, right? This is only for host. Correct. So these are the default metrics which probably all cloud providers have. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I mean that is there any uh, centralized way or uh, dashboarding thing so that I can monitor in a particular? Uh, let's say I have a five subscription on Azure, right? But mm -hmm. I want to monitor my all five subscription through a single dashboard. Uh, default, I don't think there is anything, right? But uh, maybe you can create some solution using the APIs. But uh, I, I don't think there is at this time anything where it will show you all your five subscriptions, uh, what's going on. And obviously, you know, as I was telling you earlier, we have something called VM Agent, which we'll be quickly looking at. Um, you can use that agent to deploy certain extensions, um, and you know, using those extensions, you can you can then monitor your virtual machines. All right. Okay, great. Um, so, uh, what I quickly wanted to show you guys was uh, the templates that we spoke about. In this example, I just want to show you, you know, how this looks. Like, you know, Simon Davis has created. Uh, a template which creates two new VMs, uh, installs Active Directory domain services, and creates a new forest and a domain, right? So uh, if I want, I can go look at the code on GitHub, or if I just say deploy to Azure. And I told you that it's a JSON format. It accepts uh, parameters. Um, we'll just, I'll just show you quickly how that looks. And if I were to just select this guy and say OK, it would just go out, create those VMs for me, uh, all that stuff, right? And you see this? These are the parameters that it accepts. It's telling me the username, I need to provide the password, what's going to be the domain name, what's going to be the DNS prefix, 
what is my RDP port, uh, all this kind of stuff, right? You just have to agree to this uh, terms and conditions. You can read through this and uh, this will deploy the two VMs, install the ADDC roles, create a domain and a forest for you, right? So that's plenty of, and if, if you are the kind of guy uh, who actually likes to play around with JSON, you can create some of the stuff, go ahead and, you know, uh, contribute to the community. Uh, Microsoft quickly accepts most of this if they find this interesting. Or if there's any use case that you are trying to resolve and you think that it's not already available, you can always contribute back to the community there, right? Right, so this created the virtual machine, um, right? While we are here with this, I'm actually, uh, you know, opening that port 80 for on that NSG for this VM. And if you see, I think that VM is already created. Yeah, my VM is here. It's already running. It has a public IP address. So you can see I'm just connected to that guy right now. I can do something of that sort. It tells me what is the IP address assigned to it, all that kind of stuff, right? Uh, what I'm gonna do is quickly install maybe a web server at Nginx and see if I can actually Might be slow because we used uh, a small VM size. So we'll get back to that. Um, and once everything is done, I don't need anything. You know, I can just say delete that resource group. And everything for this VM was created under that, that resource group. It's going to go out and you know delete all of that stuff. So let's go back to the slides. So we saw all of this. We saw availability sets as well. We, uh, Scale sets, right? So uh, again, going back to our discussion, this is nothing but auto scaling feature available within Azure, where I have a certain virtual machine or certain application that does a similar job. I can go ahead and define saying that when this sort of workload is present on this application, go ahead and create a new instance of a similar virtual machine, right? And what are the benefits of this? It is easy to create and manage multiple virtual machines. It provides high availability and application resiliency. Uh, it allows my application to automatically scale as my demand changes, and it works as large scale. So I think on the UI, on a single set, uh, on a single scale set, you can create up to 100 VMs. I think using the APIs, and if you give a valid justification to Microsoft, I think that number increases to about 500 or 1,000. Uh, uh, we'll, we'll quickly try and, you know, create a scale set or at least if not create, show how the UI looks and uh, how you go about this. The next topic of discussion is uh, VM agent. The primary role is for this agent is to enable and execute virtual machine extensions. Now extensions are, uh, we'll try and define that in the next slide, but these are small programs that uh, you can use to run against the VMs, right? So uh, this is installed on Windows, deployed from Azure Marketplace by default. You can also install it, install it manually on your custom, uh, or maybe you created a VM in Azure that did not exist in the marketplace. You uploaded the ISO and created something out of it. Uh, there is a offline version of this agent available that you can then use and install. Linux, uh, it's called Azure Linux agent or WA agent. You can use this for uh, free BSD and Linux 
virtual machines. Extensions are, as I said earlier, small applications that provide post deployment configuration and automation tasks. The most common one that I see people using is a custom script extension where you want to, you know, let's say you have a bash script or a PowerShell script that you want to execute against that virtual machine. You don't want to log into the VM. Uh, just from the portal, provide that .ps1 script, hit enter. It's going to go out, use that VM agent to execute those commands against the VM. And, and provide you the desired results. Common extensions, as I told you earlier, custom script extension, uh, DSC, if you guys are into uh, configuration management, you might know about Perfect Chef and all that. Microsoft has its own thing called desired state configuration. There's an extension for that, uh, which you can use. You can use some of this for diagnostics and uh, virtual machine access, right? So we'll, uh, as a demo, what I have scheduled is to execute a custom script against a Windows virtual machine. Let's see how that goes. Okay. This is taking a while, so we'll get back to that. Yeah, so before, uh, I think we covered availability sets. We covered different ways that you want to, you can deploy your virtual machine. Uh, the only thing that we haven't covered is a scale set. Uh, we'll try and see at least from the UI how it looks. Right, so here you have a scale set. Let's say I want to create it. So firstly, it's going to say, you know, what is the name of your scale set going to be and what operating system that you want to install, right? So I'm just going to say maybe CentOS based this. Uh, resource group use an existing or a new one, what location, uh, what's going to be the username, what's going to be the password. And by default, uh, how many instance count that you want to deploy. Obviously, I need two at the very least. What is the instance size? Do you want to use managed disk, yes or no? And do I want auto scaling enabled? I would obviously say yes. Uh, what is the minimum number of VMs that you want on this scale set? I would say one. What is the maximum? I would say 10. And what's going to be your scale out threshold? I mean, in this UI, you only see CPU. But once a scale set is created, you have multiple other options available. Based on that, you can actually go ahead and define what's 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 best suiting your application. If you have an application that is I/O intensive, you know you might be, might want to have a scale out option set to I/O and not CPU. If it's memory, then you might want to set uh, memory as your scale out threshold. Uh, similarly, scale in. So I'm saying here, here that if the CPU threshold increases to 75 percent go ahead and add one VM to this scale set. And if it reduces below 25 degrees of virtual machine. And, uh, you know, what do I want? I, do I want an application gateway or do I want a load balancer? If I use an application gateway, uh, my, you know, it's going to be optimal for web based traffic. Uh, and these are some, these are the protocols that it would support. Uh, if I have a requirement where I want to do SSL offloading, application gateways is best recommended. Uh, if that's not my requirement and I just want to do everything using IP based, I can then select the load balancer. The only requirement for that is I need to create a public IP address beforehand and provide that here. And I would then have to create a domain name which is unique within this uh, subdomain here, right? So once I provide all of these details, I hit on create. It will go out and create a scale set for me uh, and it will take care of. Uh, as and when the load increases, it's going to go ahead and create uh, more instances and add to that scale set.
Right, so what I did was I just created a, a dot ps1 script which is going to install the web server role on the VM that we have created earlier, right? So uh, we'll be giving this example or we're looking at this to show you guys uh, how the extensions work, right? So against this VM, since this is already running and we are already connected to it. And if I show you the roles and features, you would see that. I just say next. The web server rule is not installed right now, right? It, it's not done yet. So once I come here, I have. Extensions. I'm going to add an extension. I'm going to say custom script and create it's going to ask me for a file i will then create uh, select that ps1 script that i just showed and you see it basically created a temp storage account to upload that ps1 script just say okay to that it's submitting the deployment the deployment is in progress We'll get back to that. Um, what's my IP address for this guy? It wouldn't load for now, uh, but once the deployment is complete, you would see that the IIS role would be installed on it. So this is going to take a few few seconds. Uh, do you have any questions at this time? So, uh, do we have uh, any way to monitor the security attacks or a uh, way to prevent the uh, security prospect for this Azure VM? So you, you How mean? How do I prevent and know? You mean the DDoS yes. attack or something of that sort? Or, uh, or you can say the doing the hardened VM and compliant it for the prevention of attacks or any vulnerability. Um, so firstly, you know, you will have to uh, understand is that VM firstly talking on the public interface or not. If it's within, uh, if all your VMs do not have to talk, to the outer world, uh, there is nothing that you'll have to probably do, right? Because Microsoft, again, will take care of the networking stack for you, right? Anything at the, on the VM, you'll have to take care of it. But uh, below that, if it's, if the VM is, what I'm trying to mean is if the VM is not talking to the outside world, there's probably no extra steps that are required. But if it's talking to the outside world, then you would have to protect it as you would on your on-prem uh, on -prem instance of that virtual machine, right? Typically, whatever you've been doing, on on prem you're going to do the same thing to be able to protect it on the cloud as well because anything above the operating system you are responsible for uh, taking care of it so whatever the operating system hardening or security recommendation need to be taken care of. obviously yes okay all right And do we have any log forwarding system? I want uh, keep my log for the audit and forensic purpose. I want to move my log from uh, cloud to on-premises or somewhere else. Um, not thought of it. Let me see. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure of that answer uh, this time, Kuwar, but. No problem. Um, because hope you understand, right? Yes, we yes, have yes, yes. to forward our logs, right? Correct, yeah. I think there should be something in the diagnostic settings. Let's see. And do we have any uh, use case, better use case for unmanaged disk? Um, not really, man. I mean, uh, Microsoft always now recommends that you go with managed because uh, this was not there earlier, right? So, uh, you know, if cloud is something that changes on a daily What basis. I understand that managed disk means it is highly available, 
managed by the team means microsofts okay mm-hmm. uh, unmanaged i think that uh, or that uh, i have to manage or the or the consumer has to manage right yeah you you and you are, you are the guy who is making no, a decision exactly so it could be like if i am going to create my own uh, any kind of object based storage or any subscription for storage so i can use my unmanaged storage okay or any uh, other way to design my storage right out right. of box function yeah 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 Ideally, if you're using VM disks, uh, you know I would recommend go with managed. But if you're using that storage account, uh, you know for and just maybe you know keeping some files, uh, just dumping some data there, then you would want to create uh, a storage account. But otherwise, uh, for VMs, you know just go with managed. Is it, it's one, it's less overhead. Second, you know the SLA that you get there is is very high. and you don't have to even bother about how or what is done behind the scenes you just get uh, what you what you promised perfect and educational question so do we have any uh, as i know the demo subscription are available right free subscriptions are available Yes so I told you last time uh, you know once you join the uh, or actually sign up for Azure you get a free account uh, where you get $200 uh, that you can use for the first uh, one month right and post that there are certain services that are available for 12 months and there are certain services which are always free like uh, with with 12 months you get one b1s linux virtual machine that you can run for 750 hours per month similarly you get one b1s b1s is the series uh, of windows instance that you can run for 750 hours uh, if i remember correctly you get two 64 gb managed disks which you can use for 12 months a um, lot of stuff like that where uh, you, know, you get certain services free um, i think yeah there are certain services like container services if you just testing that are available yeah. always free there's a dedicated web page you can go through it uh, which explains what are the different services and that are 12 available for 12 months and what are the ones that are available for free all right and the last humble request Mm-hmm. uh feel free uh to give us 10 or 15 minutes any other sessions on the azure certification track as oh, yeah. i know the absolutely okay there are some changes that are going on if i remember uh, correctly uh, you know earlier what i used to recommend people was or at least what i wanted to do in the recent past was uh, create a uh, clear my 7533 exam uh that's just designed like how you have aws solution architect uh, track it's it's more about knowing what microsoft has to offer and uh, not in depth uh, administrator kind of a thing but more of a architect level just understanding you know what different services are how they interact with each other uh, but uh, just 3 uh, weeks back uh, microsoft is completely trying to redesign the certification so i would just ask you guys to maybe hold on for a few months uh, right now what happens is with the 753 or 7533 you'll have to know about you know web applications you'll have to know about uh, virtual machines network storage security all this stuff monitoring uh, but now they are redesigning their certifications based on what role you play for example if you are an azure administrator uh, in the 753 you'll have to sometimes even learn about how development of things are done on azure right i mean as an admin i i don't really care or i might have my interest is not even into that right so now they're redesigning where they are going to make separate tracks saying azure administrator and azure developer right so some of the so things right. which are going to be against developer track it's it's mostly going to be concentrating on how do you use azure services that will mostly fall under your pass applications right 
And if you look at administrator, yeah. you are mostly working under the IaaS platform where infrastructure as a service, because that's what we've been traditionally doing as IT admins, right? Uh, so that that differentiation is coming very soon. Uh, most of the exam content that I look remains the same, but a few reshuffling of stuff has happened here or there. Uh, just wait for maybe a month or two. We'll have more clear guidelines as to uh, when uh, they will be released or what time they'll be available for public consumption. They just finished the beta testing. I know a, a few friends of mine who actually participated in the beta exam. Uh, we will have some update maybe within a month or two as to when those exams will go live and are, are the existing exams still going to be there or uh, what is Microsoft's plan of action as to do they want to deprecate it or do they want to keep this alongside with the new ones so we'll have more information soon and you know once I have that more info uh, I can you know schedule maybe a quick 15 or 30 minute session to explain how that works. Perfect. So last question, let's say if uh, my organization already has a uh, TechNet subscription for licensing, okay? Uh -huh. um, if, if they're planning to migrate their workload on the cloud, Azure, right? Mm -hmm. So so my license will work in Azure? Oh, absolutely. So if you've already bought some licenses and you have a volume licensing server in-house, uh, Azure has something called Azure Hub. You can go ahead mm -hmm. and specify all your details there and uh, you can use the licenses that you've already got uh, to go ahead and apply to your VMs that you create in the cloud. So license, my existing license will be usable there, right? Absolutely, absolutely. Okay. Right, so uh, yeah, going back to our example, uh, you know, that script was executed against this guy. Earlier you could see there was nothing running here. So if I just do a refresh quickly, I should see an uh, IS role or IIS install on this guy. Why are none of the demos working today? Okay, can anybody tell me why this isn't working or what's wrong with this? I don't know if you guys noticed. Uh, but we haven't allowed the port 80, so it's not going to work. Right, so we only said inbound connection is going to be on 3389. So I'm just going to quickly add 80 to this. Supports are not trusted. Uh, I'm sorry, Kuvar, can you repeat that? I said ports are not open and published. Exactly, right. So I, I hadn't, I didn't have that port 80 open, so you know, I was not able to actually bring this up. You see this? Now this obviously it's not HTTPS because I didn't allow uh, 443 port, but I can actually read this. Uh, right? If I, if I really had some website that's being hosted here, I can just you know use this guy here. So yeah, I think that's that's all I have for today. Um, any questions and any feedback that you have on the session, I'm, I'm happy to take. I think go back up. Adil, I have some questions. Back up piece is there. Yeah. Sure, go ahead. Uh, Adil, uh, when you're trying to uh, create a new VM, um, mm -hmm. are we able to customize? Like, uh, I want some something like uh, I want four CPUs, and uh, maybe there are some certain uh, pre configured uh, setups are there. Apart from that, are we able to customize it according to our requirements? 
no uh, no you have to look at the size and uh, accordingly select whatever is the closest you might not be able to actually get uh, specific requirements like for example i selected uh, you no know, the psv1 uh, which had 3.5 gb of memory Correct. i can't say that i want a 3 gb of memory for that vm uh, you don't have the granular control at this time okay and one more thing uh, sometimes even while we are trying to uh, deploy vms we find uh, sometimes only uh, data center versions uh, why microsoft is not giving um, standard version do you have any any idea about it uh, is just upselling i guess maybe they want to uh, you know cuz that's probably the most used addition and they want to sell more of those and not sell standard maybe but i don't have a exact reason why uh, they would not because more, i think data center has more feature set than the standard one right yeah but but sometimes we we may try to um, host some website for ias kind of mm-hmm. stuff so we don't want to go for data center addition so is is again it is a costing right it's again if it is coming as same uh, standard price no problem but uh, how just confusion on on that part whether so you can if if you really need the standard edition you know you can just uh, upload your own image and create a vm out of it right okay so that that i mean they, you have that flexibility always where you know the marketplace is not always going to have all sorts of images right so you can create your own image upload it and create a vm out of it okay cool cool yeah so i i would say the something for the uh, backup like uh-huh. you the secure vm backup okay from so what solutions will be there right Oh, for backup, uh, we, we spoke the other day, right? So any VMs uh, that are natively created in Azure, uh, you can backup using the Recovery Services Vault. Uh, you know, there's a checkbox uh, as we saw for other, you know, the boot diagnostic and all of that. There was a checkbox for backup as well. Just say click enable. All Microsoft expects you to do behind the scenes is, you know. Uh, create a storage account Correct. and create a recovery so, services vault so that is the comes under the package of that bm right we have to enable the backup right correct mm-hmm. but we cannot integrate any third party solution to backup it it depends where do you want do you want to you want to bring that data back to on prem or you want to keep the data on cloud no no let's say i want to use any other solution to backup my azure vm I don't want to the use the Microsoft backup here. Mm-hmm. So you can use it. Uh, you can definitely use, uh, for example, Rubrik. My company itself uh, offers. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, we we can protect some of your workloads in the cloud. Uh, for Azure, we call mm-hmm. something called Cloud Cluster. But as of today, we do not have a native capability where uh, we can backup your Azure virtual machines. but we can we have an agent based install where you know we can go ahead and install some of your file uh, sorry backup some of your files within your windows virtual machines and linux virtual machines right so you can use any third party right. backup vendor you want uh, again that that probably going to be an agent based solution uh, because as of oh. today i don't think a lot of vendors uh, allow you to uh, backup the system state of the azure virtual machines we are still trying to figure out Uh, for our own product we were able to uh, with a newer release of the software for rubric we were able to protect uh, native aws ec2 instances right uh, so we have in the next release hopefully uh, again don't quote me on this but you know we should be able to protect uh, virtual machines as well so we are working towards that all right great uh satish shanawas any anything for me okay i'll take that as a no so if there are no questions guys uh, i'll drop off thank you so much for joining uh i would i would be happy to take any feedback you have or anything that you guys think was not good or good if it's good then what 
would you like me to do continue doing uh, if you guys are liking this uh, series i have uh, maybe storage and network like how we took uh, looked into virtual machine specifically i can have some sessions which will dive deep into azure storage and azure networking because these are the three things that form the core of your infrastructure as a service right so uh, my plan is to you know cover this for our uh, v experts so that you know you have grasp or cross platform or uh, you have ex more experience on different technologies right so that's what i intend to do and if there are any feedback uh, drop me a message or i'm available anytime on the phone i'm happy to take that feedback and you know uh, we can try and make this uh, more interactive in the future as well